Um, yeah, so it was about a year and a half. It was actually right during the middle of the, the whole pandemic COVID stuff that was going on. Uh, it was like the summer of 2020 when all of that kind of hit. Um, and I've been a, a fan of the blog of OWA. It's run by uh, Myron Rumsey, who runs it. Um, so I've been listening to his uh, podcast for a while and I uh, got in touch with him and see if it was kind of okay with him if I could start just like a book club um just an online thing you know we started out mainly on skype we actually started through the facebook page originally with their uh their team rooms uh started there and then kind of moved over to skype um but he kind of gave me my blessing to uh go ahead and kind of start um this kind of like just basically like a weekly book club where we went and just picked random green lantern stories and sometimes we do a modern story sometimes we do something from you know the 60s and then you know in between and every week we kind of got together and we'd read, you know, three or four issues kind of all the way around. Mm -hmm. Um, like I said, this is kind of our core group. That's kind of, you know, every week, you know, it's been consistent with us. Um, we've read several of your stories. Um, we read, uh, like the original Manhunter story that you did with JLA back in the seventies. Um, and we read several of the, uh, the eighties run as well. Um, when you changed it to Green Lantern core, read like the Slack story where he was in the future. And then, um, the story with with Carol Ferris and the and the Predator and all that story. So yeah. um, you're definitely one of our favorite writers. Uh, so um, kind of reached out through through your um, I guess your website and kind of your email contact there. Um, yeah. Actually, yeah, I originally heard about you from uh, Rick Verbonis. Uh He runs the the Captain America comic book. Oh page. yeah, yeah. And uh, he had you on a little bit ago um, and was was chatting with you. So I kind of got your website and the contact info from him and then, you know, reached out to you and you were gracious enough to kind of give us an hour. So we appreciate it. No problem. Um, so that's kind of the, the genesis of it. Um, so we had some, some questions uh, that we kind of have lined up for you. So we'll kind of take turns kind of jumping in if that's okay. Just um, asking a few things, uh, but just really to kind of kick it off. Um, how did your time on Greenland Lantern starts? Um, how were you, did you have to like pitch your, your um, kind of what you wanted to do for Green Lantern or did like DC editorial approach you about it or how did that come about? Um, I was working, I had quit comics at that point and was working for Atari uh, doing game design. And um, I went down to the San Diego comic book convention in 1984, which I did even when I wasn't in comics. And both Jim Shooter from Marvel and Dick Giordano from DC came up and said, hey, you ever think you want to do comics again? And I'm like, no, I'm doing game design. That's cool. And then I went home and that Sunday night after the convention, my boss at Atari called me up and he said, I think we're all going to get fired on Wednesday. They just sold the company. Um, so on Monday, I called up Giordano and Shooter and said, actually, maybe I would be interested. And, and having worked, you know, mostly for Marvel, but then doing Batman and Justice League right at the end of my first tenure at DC, I thought I would work for both companies rather than just be one, you know, with one or the other. So I ended up getting um, various, you know, things at Marvel I did, um, Vision Witch and West Coast Avengers and forget what else I got at that point. But Giordano said, I'd like you to take over Green Lantern. Um, Len Wein had been doing it right with uh, oh, yeah. Dave Blank in the name all of a sudden, but Gibbons. Mm -hmm. um, and Len, I guess, had just left. I mean, I'm pretty sure that Len wasn't pushed off. Um, I think I just was, the timing was right that um, that's what they needed. So he said, I'd like you to do Green Lantern. And I loved Green Lantern. I had always loved Green Lantern. Um, the John Broom, Gil Kane stuff. Um, I, I love the mythos of it, which, you know, Julie Schwartz stole a lot of it from the Lensman and, and all that stuff that, that's well known. But, um, you know, the Guardians and the, the different Green Lanterns and, and so forth. So I was very happy to take over Green Lantern. I, you know, I really liked Green Lantern. Um, and I came in right in the middle of that whole Predator story. And Len had not told me at the time, he had not 
decided who the predator was. He just was doing the predator. Um, so it was up to me, you know, it would thus become up to me to figure out who the predator was. And John Stewart, of course, was the Green Lantern. But everybody said, well, you all, you understand that Hal Jordan will come back. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I mean, that makes sense. I like Hal Jordan. Um, but once I got into it, I said, yeah, but I like John Stewart too. Why does John Stewart always have to be relegated um, when Hal Jordan comes back? So that was, all that stuff was like floating around in my brain as I was, and then they had the crisis on infinite earths <laughs> at the same time. And we were all supposed to participate in that. So all that stuff was floating around in my brain um, when I was asked to take over Greenland. Wow. It's such a crazy time to like jump in and like you said with just everything that was going on they're like oh yeah there's a predator going on oh by the way this and oh we're doing a massive line wide <laughs> crossover <laughs> well but you i mean that's part of being comic book writer i guess right i mean there's always going to be somebody who did the issue before you got there and there'll be somebody doing the issue after you leave so mm -hmm. it's I, it's not you know it's not uncommon to take over a storyline in the middle of something or walk into a situation. Um, I always, I'm not one of those guys who comes in and goes, well, now that I'm here, everything's different. Um, I like the illusion that this is all the character going through time. And so if I didn't like a story that I was handed I would still take it, but then I would move it and the moving of it to where I wanted to go was several issues in and of itself. It's my usual thing. I didn't have to do much. I mean, again, I think the idea was that John Stewart would go away. Um, but other than that, I don't think there was anything that I chose, you know, where I said, I'm going to take this someplace else now it is true that len didn't know who the predator was and i came up with this idea that it was carol ferris um uh but that you know i wasn't changing anything that he had started i just was finding the most interesting way to me to finish up what he had started very cool very cool um chris do you want to jump on yours you have quite a history with the manhunters you developed their mythology in 1977 in JLA 140 through 141 and later Millennium. How did the story in the JLA come about? Well, I had read, you know, Kirby's Manhunter, the one issue of Kirby's Manhunter in the modern era. Um, and I thought that would make, and, and I had also read the, the um, Archie Goodwin, Walt Simonson Manhunter run before that, but it was more the Kirby Manhunter, I think, that I was thinking about. Um, just seemed like it would fit that there was this whole group of Manhunters, and so that made sense for the JLA. I mean, you, with, a, with a group like the JLA, you need, with any group, you need to have either some super, super powerful menace or a group of people who are a super powerful menace. And the Manhunters seemed like they would do that. Um, later in Millennium, um, they asked me, they said, you know, this year for the for the wheat country company-wide crossover, we'd like you to do it. What are your ideas? Um, and I came up with this idea that every DC series should have a secret agent in it who was actually a Manhunter. And, and so that excited a lot of people, pissed off a few people <laughs> at the company. But I, you know, I said to every writer, I said, have you got a character that you don't need? I mean, somebody that you can sacrifice to this. And again, most people were good about that. Some people weren't, you know. Um, those company-wide crossovers always... You know, there's a lot of politics involved. There are, there are writers who play well with others, and there are writers who don't play well with others. And every writer would have some overall storyline in their head. And so saying, can you ditch one of your characters 
some people, again, had no problem with that at all. And, and I was surprised at some of the big names that they turned out to be. Um, other people, we had to, you know, we had to politic a little bit. But um, once again, the fact that there were a lot of them, that the Manhunters were like this secret organization that, that, that had a lot of people involved in it, um, fit the bill. Um, in both cases, I was using them primarily for that aspect that they were there. I, you said that I evolved their continuity or something, and I guess I did, but I never, I've never felt like the Manhunters were um, mine or, you know, or, or that I was in charge of them. I just was using them at that time. Because again, that was, uh, I mean, Kirby didn't do any more with it and, and, and Archie and Walt had stopped doing anything with it, but um, it's still, they were just, they were just good DC villains, it's my theory. <laughs> To what degree did you draw from John Broom's Silver Age GL stories? And do you have a favorite run besides your own? Um, well, I mean, the original, all that original stuff from the, you know, from the early 60s, because um, they just did build all that, that mythos over time. It wasn't just the Flash got hit by a lightning bolt and now he's fast. And the story, this was, you know... Hal Jordan got his ring from a dying Abin Sur, and then there were guardians and there were other guardians, you know, and, and um, that was fascinating as a, as a reader, as a kid reading that stuff. Um, so I liked, you know, probably the first 50, 60 issues by the, by about then it was getting into, um, sort of 70s relevance and I, I and I'm not talking about the Neil Adams Denny O'Neill stuff I mean that was even later but um maybe so maybe it was late 60s relevance but it was it sort of lost some of the mythology and began to become more of a an issues oriented uh book I thought and the you know and Gil Kane left and and John Broom left and you know, I'm, I'm mixing up time errors here but but by the time we got to issues you know this is best i can remember but i mean around 50 60 70 it began to change and i thought it really got bad around 100 i thought you know the, the, the it was denny o'neill but i didn't think that the stories had much going for him and the art was you know so when when i was asked to take over with what one 83 193 somewhere in there <laughs> you guys know better than i do um i mean i really hadn't read green lantern for years at that point because it really i thought it had fallen off it you know it had lost all of its magic all of its all of its um relevance um for one of a better term um so one thing i certainly wanted to do was to get back get that feeling of galactic grandeur and mythology and so forth that was another thing i wanted to do but i just you know a regular green lantern for the first 50 issues um i actually don't know anymore if i ever did when john broom left i was more aware when gil kane left but um it was just you know i Green Lantern was my favorite of the of the DC characters next to Batman. I mean, I, I love Batman too, but but uh, you know, I liked him better. I th I loved Flash, Carmine Infantino, all that early stuff that they did. But um, um, I'm an originalist, I guess. I, I liked uh, I liked what they what Julie Schwartz, Broom, and and Kane did. When they created the whole thing. 
the member that uh, we don't have uh, tonight, who's uh, hopefully will make it later on, will probably absolutely love that response when he hears it. Uh, he's a huge, huge John Broom fan. It's his favorite run. So he uh, he definitely pulled out how much you pull from it with the cosmic aspect of it and like the big sci-fi element. So he'll love that answer. <laughs> uh, I, I, you had already mentioned that, you know, when you came on, John Stewart's the titular character for Green Lantern. And so I have that like 188. 188. <laughs> well, halfway between 183 and 193, right? Yes, pretty close. Okay. And so, yeah, here's the first issue where you came on. And I guess maybe you mentioned this a little bit, but uh, maybe to add a little bit more to, you know, how is it to write for John Stewart, you know, with Hal Jordan kind of He's obviously also a main character during this, but did the having John Stewart as the main Green Lantern uh, allow you some freedom that you didn't maybe wouldn't have had if Hal Jordan had been the Green Lantern, or and was, there, and was there pressure to bring back Hal Jordan as a Green Lantern sooner than you did? No, um, I mean again, everybody just assumed that Hal Jordan would be back. I mean that, but there wasn't a pressure to bring him back. I mean. Um, but John Stewart was the Green Lantern and I really, you know, I like characters. I like to write characters. And I, you know, I looked at John Stewart, who of course had been very different in the Neil Adams, Denny O'Neill days, but this was the John Stewart that was there that Len had been writing. Um, and I said, you know, why does this guy always get relegated? I mean, he's, you know, there's, I mean, he's black, right? But there's no reason that he has to be the second banana here in, in this thing. And so I was happy to have him be the main Green Lantern. And then, you know, because, and, and Hal Jordan was having this whole soap opera in the back. He was there all the time doing his thing. Um, and once I decided to make Carol Ferris the predator, then obviously there was a nice Hal Jordan story to be had, um, but John Stewart was was hanging around with Cat Matui by this time, and and Cat Matui became one of my favorite characters of all. I mean, I really liked her. I was really unhappy when they killed her, um, uh, but in my era, she wasn't dead, and and so in developing John Stewart. The relationship between him and Katma began to be, you know, began to form, and and her being a sort of more experienced Green Lantern uh, worked well with him. He wasn't inexperienced, but he just didn't have hadn't done it very much, and and so all of that stuff made for parallel stories that were um, that were interesting to me. That had you know that had reason to exist, had things going on. Um, and I may be jumping ahead, but I mean, it was it was when I said to myself, John Stewart doesn't need to be relegated, not as soon as I said that, but I mean, within a couple issues, I'm thinking, what about the other guy? You know, what about Guy Gardner? You know, why can't he um, be involved in this? Um, and that's coming out of the, I guess, the idea that there's a lot of them, right? Um, and so the fact that I had two led me to have three, led me to have the Green Lantern Corps, um, all my faves, um, you know, from from previous writers, right? And uh, plus Kilowog, um, uh, but that was it was like the whole the whole book was in play. It wasn't just like you're taking over a single character who has a couple of supporting characters and you work with that. But all of them had, you know, had stories. And, and I mean, um, I decided that Guy Gardner, I mean, we'd seen Guy Gardner three times and he was, and he'd been a vegetable for 50 issues, right? I mean, it was like, um, I, I will mention that this has become a sore point with me and and DC um, in that we took this character that nobody was using and nobody cared about. And Joe Staten and I turned him into somebody that a lot of people used and cared about. Um, 
And DC's official position, I will say, is you didn't create him. John Broom and Gil Kane created him. Therefore, you don't get any royalties, any credit, any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Joe points out that that he's the first Green Lantern to that time to have a not to have a variation on the same costume. He, you know, mm-hmm. Joe designed a new character. I created a new character, but we don't get any 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 credit um, officially. Um, so there's that, but that wasn't there at the time. And I just, you know, I really liked, I liked, you know, both John and Hal in their own way were fairly stable characters. And so I came up with this idea of a, of a really unstable character as, as a Green Lantern. Um, so John Stewart because it was John Stewart. I mean, if I had taken over the book and Hal Jordan was the star, I probably would not have. Well, I can't say that, but uh, the odds, I wouldn't have immediately thought, oh, let's get more Green Lanterns in here. I probably would have been satisfied with Hal Jordan because that comes from the the era that I, you know, that I, that got me into the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Kind of having all the, the toys in the toy box to play with. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Um, did you ever get any like, uh, like what was the reaction when you re- completely re over, I guess, re overhauled uh, Guy Gardner and kind of gave him a completely new personality? And because he was a pretty straight laced character to begin with, and then you kind of completely overhauled him and gave him that kind of gruff, um, kind of salt of the earth kind of personality that everyone kind of knows him and associates with him. Right. Well, he was, you know, in his first appearance. He was a, you know, a standard hero. I mean, a nice, good hero. The second couple, the second set of appearances when he get, became a vegetable, that's not my favorite era. I didn't think, you know, I mean, so what? He just, you know, it, it wasn't the whole Carrie, what's her name thing. I mean, that, that stuff was, um, I didn't think that was all that good. So I felt like, we'd only seen him a couple of times and he hadn't been that well delineated most of those times. So I didn't, I figured I had carte blanche and, 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 and just wanted to come up with somebody who would be an interesting addition to the Green Lantern family. Right. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, um, you know, I just, that just seemed right just to do him that way. And again, there was no, um, it, the general theory of comics is that if you're turning your book in on time and it's selling, then you're doing okay. So, um, Giordano, I mean, we, uh, Joe and I doubled the sales on Green Lantern. Um, Giordano was kind enough to put that in print, which I think made DC unhappy. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, so we were just, you know, we were just exploring all the, and I would say Joe Staten is, was just as much interested in all of this stuff as I was. I, I did not plot it with him. I mean, he, I came up with the stories, he drew them, but I mean, he was, as you can tell from redesigning Guy Gardner's costume. I mean, he, he really enjoyed doing it. Um, Joe was great to work with. That's really cool. Just kind of, you know, taking the open slates and kind of the blank spots in Green Lantern mythology and just, you know, fleshing them out and exploring them and adding them like so much more to the mythos. Um, kind of just like another, you know, Gil Kane, John Broom, you know, kind of going from nothing and then just adding more to it. So that's pretty cool. Um, uh, Lincoln actually, uh, I guess, coined the term that you're the uh, the great reconciler of the, uh, the Green Lantern mythology, speaking of the mythology, um, because you, you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier where you said, you kind of like to keep the illusion of, you know, these characters are moving through time and it's kind of one, you know, continuous story that's all happening to them. Um, so to that end, you, on your run, you seem to kind of take all of the mythology and really kind of condense it into one kind of timeline where you took uh, the Manhunters and, you know, put them into the Green Lantern mythology and actually came up with, you know, this happened three billion years ago, this happened two billion years ago, and you kind of put <laughs> yeah. it all, all together. Um, and then with Carol as well, I know you said you kind of jumped on 
you know, when the predator thing was just kind of up in the air and you used it to not only make Carol the predator, but completely reconcile like all of her history and put it on kind of one timeline and kind of explain all of it. Yeah, I have a, I mean, I definitely have a kind of sense for being able to read stories written by different people over the 30 years and kind of find the through line. And when I, you know, when I thought, I mean, it certainly wasn't all a flash of lightning. I mean, I must have thought, what if it was Carol Ferris? Because again, I think one thing that I did do was um, when I come onto a book, you know, I kind of think about what's working and what what isn't. And I thought, you know, the Carol Ferris thing had been around for 183 issues at that point. And, and uh, was that going to go anywhere? I'm sure I thought about, you know, what about Hal and Carol as a couple? Blah. And I was like, nah, that doesn't interest me. I mean, we've seen that a lot. So somehow in that, I said, what if the predator was actually a woman who was Carol Fair? And then so I did read all the, you know, I went back and I read all of the stuff, including the stuff that I hadn't read. Um, with Carol Ferris. And then, of course, the cool thing was Joe Staten did the artwork in the style of every artist mm-hmm. in the flashback, right? I mean, that's that was that'll tell you, you don't have to do that, right? But um, uh, so, but it made sense to me. I mean, I could I could see a through line where she would have gone, could have gone down this route. Uh, and of course, she had been contacted and turned into the Star Sapphire previously. So she had, there was a, there was an undercurrent there that, you know, maybe she hadn't completely turned away from all that. And it, all those things came together. And, and um, I do like coherent stories, you know, I mean, I like, um, again, not to the point where it all comes to an end and then there's nothing else for anybody to do, but um, um I like coherent. I like big. Didn't feel there'd been a lot of that, um, you know, uh, for a while. So uh, all that came together. And, and and once the Predator turned out to be Carol Ferris, that obviously had repercussions for Hal, but it also had repercussions for the book. I mean, it's, it's sort of said, this is not your grandfather's green lantern here. We're, you know, we're, we want to do something here. We want to, we want to make, we want to play with all the toys as, Mm -hmm. as you said, you know? Um, So, and then right after that was when the, the, the the, um, crisis started and we were, uh, the only thing we were supposed to do was have the skies turn red. Um, (laughs) there, There wasn't, I think maybe, uh, I'm, it's uh, it's been 30 years so I'm blanking on on the name of the the female who was in all the uh, running through the whole series Len oh, yeah. uh, Mar- Mar- Har- Har- Harbinger Harbinger yeah 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 Harbinger oh. well she had to show up she had to do something right but other than that, it was that same kind of deal. It's like, as long as you can do that, you can do anything you want to do. Um, so, um, but this was the crisis on infinite earths. Nobody had done this sort of thing before. And I didn't, you know, I wasn't privy to it, but I thought if all this is happening, I can kind of go along for that ride too. I can, you know, and so that's why, You know, they knew they told they said when it's all going to come when the crisis was going to come to a head. So I thought, well, that's when I'll bring my stuff to a head. And that would be issue 198, which is right close to 200. So all of that should just be some big thing. Um, and so um, the rest is history. <laughs> you know, that's that was just. Writing, you know, writing to me is, 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 um, you're just connecting things. You're finding interesting things and finding ways to connect them. Um, 
And of course, it has to make sense and it has to have a climax. And it's got, I mean, there's all these structures involved in writing. But the first thing you do is kind of figure out what do you want to write? You know, what do you, you know, how, you can figure out how to do it. But first, you got to figure out now what would be what would be cool for this. And that's, you know, that all seemed cool to me. So, yeah. Out of curiosity, did you have uh, long-term plans for, for Carol Ferris? Um, you know, as you probably know, it wasn't until the Green Lantern series came back in the 90s that, you know, she's been stuck as Star Sapphire this whole time for years and years and years. And it wasn't until the 90s that she finally uh, can leave that persona for a bit of time. But I didn't know if, 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 the run had, if your run had continued, if you had any further plans already in mind for Carol Ferris. No, um, I did the, you know, I did the one later where she, you know, where she's a dominatrix over Aresia. Um, uh, but no, I, I liked her as a villain. I liked the fact because she had the connection to Hal, right? Um, and she was with the Zamrons and they had their connection to the Guardians. And um, so I liked her in that position. Nobody ever dies forever in comics, right? Or stays star sapphire forever or whatever i mean it doesn't it doesn't surprise or bother me that later you know somebody later decided to to have her come back from that because again he probably had stories uh that he wanted to tell with carol ferris but you know when i got there um you know she'd just been um uh, how shall I say this? I uh, was really looking forward to the Green Lantern movie and was really, really disappointed in the Green Lantern movie. Now, I was not the only one who was disappointed in the movie, but, but I was disappointed because I knew how much cool stuff there was to do with that character. And, and the fact that they didn't do much of it um, was annoying to me just as a, as a knowledgeable reader. Um, and I, yeah, and I think, I mean, the first 20 minutes of that movie is Hal Jordan flying a plane and talking to Carol Ferris. It's like, you don't have that much time to spend 20 <laughs> minutes doing that. But they did, which was, you know, one of the first of their many problems. But they're, you know, so she's his boss and he's a test pilot and like they like each other. But I, there was nothing there ever, really, I thought. Um, um, I mean, they, they, various people at various times tried to, tried to make it happen, but nobody ever really made it happen. They just, it just kind of went along. So, um, no, if I had stayed on, if Joe and I had stayed on, um, we might, you know, at any given point, we might've said, oh, well, let's, let's t stop having her be the star Sapphire, but I'm not sure that would have happened. A, because I liked her the way she was. And B, I never, you know, I tended to think, what's my next story arc going to be? I did not think, what are my next three story arcs going to be? Mm -hmm. um, I liked to kind of be more in the moment, more like, here's a cool story, let's do that. And then when that's over, wherever we're at at that point, let's figure out another story to do and then and go from there. Um, so she was, I liked her as Star Sapphire. Um, and I, you know, when I did the thing where she um, took Aresia and made her kiss her boots and all that good stuff, I got this, I, this letter that I kept for years where this guy wrote, I'm not in favor of censorship. However, <laughs> he didn't like he didn't like the dominatrix end of things right um and uh but everything was sort of pushing the envelope at, on the on that uh thing i mean if she was if she was that the queen of zamoran if she was that evil why wouldn't she do something like that you know so <laughs> Uh, speaking of like the the controversy of things, that kind of goes in with with yours, Chris, about uh, Kilowog and all of his ideas. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, oh, were you some you're going to ask me something else, or am I responding to that? Oh, 
uh, if you want to say something, go ahead. Or, or Chris, maybe just, yeah, just say the whole question, then we'll. Okay. Yeah, uh, you created the character of Kilowog, one of my favorites, and helped him explore his interest in communism in Russia and Nicaragua, I think maybe China as well. What inspired Kilowog, who many forget was originally a geneticist and provided health care for the group? Yes, they many have forgotten that. Um, I put together, as I say, the Green Lantern Corps made up of people that I liked, like Aresia and Salak and Chip, you know, and Pat Matui and John. And, you know, I mean, I, I had a group, but, but, and they could all do anything with their rings, right? But um, visually, they were all, we had, we had Chip who was tiny, but the rest of them were all kind of the same size. And I just thought, I want a big guy. I want a big guy. But so I talked to Joe and Joe designed him, right? Um, but I was determined that he was not going to be the dumb big guy. You know, mm -hmm. there are lots of dumb big guys. And I thought, why can't he be a smart? I mean, he looks like a big dumb guy. But what if he is a geneticist? What if he is a scientist? And then later on, uh, down the line, I had the idea of, why does he have to be a capitalist at heart? Why, who's to say that, uh, was it Bolivox Vic? Is that where he came from? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, <laughs> who's to say Bolivox Vic was uh, uh, running on the same parameters that America was? So I thought, well, they're Green Lanterns of Earth and all that stuff came together. So um, I thought, well, you could, maybe he likes communism better. Um, and, and of course, by that time, Guy Gardner had become a lunatic and he, you know, he was very patriotic, American first lunatic and, and all that stuff was, was there. And then Joe did that wonderful cover with the banner from the old Soviet, you know, yeah. um, I mean, I don't know if I've said that I really liked working with Joe Staten, who, you know, always was up for, you know, up for fun, up for figuring out the, the best way to do stuff. Um, but it was, but I was, but so he was a communist or, you know, whatever, until he was disillusioned or what, but he was definitely smart. And when they started making him the drill sergeant, you know, that's another disappointment to me in, 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 in what happened after my run. And again, my run's my run. And, and when I stop doing it, somebody else is going to start doing it. That's understood, you know. I don't own the character. It's not proprietary. Um, um, although we did create Kilowog and Guy Gardner and, and DC will admit that we created Kilowog, but they won't admit Guy Gardner. Uh, but, you know, it's disappointing when you do something and then people who come along afterwards undo it. Right. I mean, you have no control. It's not unusual, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still personally disappointing when the stuff like that happens. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of the, the white Kilowog and having him you know, not necessarily be a capitalist, but be a communist. Um, I guess it was it Joe Staten that went to Russia um, in the 80s. And I guess it was was it his trip that inspired um, the story where Kilowog actually went to Russia and developed the Rocket Reds and um, had that story? Um, I think I was aware that Joe had gone to Russia, um, but that wasn't the genesis of it. It was, it was really my thinking, why do they all have to be on the same page? Because mm -hmm. there's, you know, they came from all these different places. Why, who's to say the entire universe runs like America? Um, as, as was obvious, I mean, he didn't stay in Russia, Kilowog. He didn't, um, you know, start a separate book called <laughs> The Communist Green Lantern Society or anything. Uh, but uh, I wanted to explore that. I mean, again, they're all different. Why, you know, um, somebody, one of my, one of my fond memories is somebody said to me, how can you write a a group book where everybody has the same power. And I said, it's not about the power. It's about the people in the group. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was always my, my take on everything that it was always about the people. 
And so I wanted to I wanted to know more about Chip. I wanted to know more about Salak. Uh, what would Salak do if he suddenly ended up getting sent to the future as a Greenland? You know, all these mm -hmm. different things um, that were all there to play with. And and Staten and I certainly would have stayed on that book. I mean, it, we did double the sales. We you know it became very popular, which is why DC and its infinite wisdom decided to put it into the Action Weekly book. And we had been doing um, all these three-part galactic epic kind of things. I was writing Silver Surfer on the other side of town by this time. And, and um, but, you know, exploring, exploring, getting out into space, doing all this stuff. And then they said, now you can have five pages a week. <laughs> and we said, well, we can't do what we do in five pages a week. So we didn't, you know, so we walked away from it. We were sort of the victims of our own success in that regard. But um, um, if that hadn't happened, we would have done that book for a long time after that. Um, I'm old school enough to think that it's fun to do a book for a length of time, right? Not just show up and do a mini series and, and disappear. So I would have, I could have run those characters for years after, you know, beyond the point where we got cut off. Wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, um, that kind of ties in with you, Chris, as, as far as like the, the team aspect of it and, and them on Earth, if you wanted to jump in on that one. Yeah, um, well, Green Lantern being a team book with aliens on Earth, uh, was part of this because team books were hot at this time? And was that your decision to have the whole team there? And what was it like to write about the human condition through the point of view of aliens? Um, it wasn't because team books were hot. I mean, team books are team books. They are what they are. And, and um, sometimes they're hot, sometimes they're not, depending on whatever. No, I just wanted to use, I wanted the Green Lantern Corps. I, I wanted to do the Green Lantern Corps. The more I got farther down the road I got, I mean, I said, okay, if there's two, why can't there be three? If there's three, why can't there be more? And and then I did go back and I did, you know, the ones that I liked, Aresia, Chip, Salak, um, uh, Kat Matui was already there. Uh, I thought, these are all good characters, you know? They'll, they'll all work well together. It will be interesting. And I will be able to like see the human condition from from other points of view. Um, but it was it was just, you know, I mean, the idea that there were a lot of them long preceded me. And so making a team within there, um, you know, I couldn't have done that if I were writing The Flash, if I, you know, if I were writing Batman, I couldn't, you know, there would be, there would have been no sense to have a team. Um, uh, but with Green Lantern, it made a lot of sense to have a team. And, and they were all characters that I liked. So it wasn't, you know, like, eh, well, I got to have this, this one hanging on over here. And you're like, no, I, you know, I think there's a lot of dynamic energy to be had by putting these people together. No, I, uh, regarding the Action Weekly run, I read an interview with Peter David where he talked about he didn't like writing for that run. Uh, his reasoning why he didn't like it was he was always told it needed to be darker. His stories weren't dark enough. And I didn't know if, was that one of the reasons, like at the very end of your run with Green Lantern Corps, the batteries destroyed with the uh, story with Sinestro and I didn't know if that was part of your original story or if that was something that DC wanted to kind of set this darker tone for Action Weekly or. Well, it was, um, again, Staten and I were cruising right along. We were not planning to leave. And then they said, hey, you guys are so successful. We're going to totally screw this up. <laughs> and so um, uh, I sort of wanted to do a final story in in a full length comic book kind of thing. There was that, but also um, DC in general had become very enamored of the dark by this time. The whole crisis thing had been a 
a huge success. And, and um, so they really thought, oh, okay, we killed the flesh and, and people like that. And, you know, all this darkness, um, which they're still involved in. I mean, it's still DC movies are very dark, right? Um, they, DC has sort of cornered the market on darkness. And, and so, um, uh, we did not feel it. Staten and I didn't feel that we were, you know, we weren't obliged to get darker. Um, my end story was, was an end story, but it doesn't surprise me at all that, that the editorial direction to people who were starting or taking over series would be, let's be dark, you know? Um, Speaking of like towards the end of the run, um, I guess your focus was, you did Millennium, which was, you know, the huge crossover event that that you um, were in charge of. And that kind of led into New Guardians. Um, uh, I know New Guardians, I guess, was similar to, Green Lantern, I don't know, were you kind of looking at, I guess, exploring kind of the human condition with it because you were kind of pulling a very like international team from all walks of life? Well, it was the thing again about, you know, that you got the entire planet. Why did they all have to come from Star City, you know, or whatever? Um, And the idea, since it was a company wide crossover, it made me think of an earth wide crossover. Um, and draw from, you know, but, but the difference was these were all supposed to be people, just normal people. I mean, I brought in Tom Kamaku, right. Um, as a Green Lantern homage, I guess, but, uh, you know, the prime minister of South Africa, a black girl living in England. I mean, all these different random people. And, and also the first major um, gay character in comics, right? Um, I said, why are, you know, if we're tr- choosing from the entire world, there's all these different options that have not been um, explored, but each one of them was just sort of standing there when they were suddenly swept up in this. And so uh, the New Guardians, um, which, by the way, I originally wanted to call Trump's like trump cards and you know that these were like the 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 people who had risen to the top Mm -hmm. and i was told specifically that in 1988 seven six whatever it was um you can't do that because donald trump will be very upset this was all the the new york all these people in new york i don't know that jeanette went to parties at donald's house right but i mean there was a social scene of, at that level and, and people knew each other. And, and so I was told you can't call it Trump's because of Donald Trump. So it became the new guardians. Um, and then just to finish that segment off, um, I went to Giordano and I said, in this book, I want to do it. I want to do sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I want, if it's people pulled from all over the world, I want to have real world, situations and problems and that's why two of them had aids and that's why you know i mean all this stuff and giordano said yeah you can do that and then when i wrote the first issue uh my editor said "Mm, you can't do this and you can't do that which was the first time that he had done that but he didn't like the real world aspects of things um and uh so i went back to giordano and i said you told me I could do this. And he said, yeah, but your editor's in charge, which is why I walked away from it at that point, because I couldn't do the book that I wanted to do. Um, so poor Carrie Bates was just sort of standing there when they said, here, finish this off. Um, too bad for Carrie, but um, um, yeah, they were, they weren't, I mean, the, the Green Lanterns are drawn from all over the universe. These guys were drawn from all over America. So they had that much sort of in parallel. But the difference was going to be that this was going to be a much sort of um, not darker, but could have been darker, I guess. Mm-hmm. But I mean, more realistic, uh, real world kind of 
political situations and 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 earth problems. That was what that book was going to be about. Yeah, yeah I was. That's what kind of my follow up with it was. You know, what kind of pushback were you getting when you were introducing things? Um, like, you know, major gay characters and uh, AIDS and even drug use and that kind of thing, you know, within that book, how much kind of pushback you got from it? Well, I got pushback on the, on the AIDS thing. That was my, that was the editorial uh, pushback. Um, as far as the gay character goes, um, there was some pushback there too. Um, but I was picking people who you would not think would be superheroes. And so I deliberately picked a guy who was kind of fruity because he would make straight people uncomfortable and he would make gay people uncomfortable. <laughs> was kind of my kind of my theory. Um, and then when he becomes at the end um, a superhero, I thought that would be like really cool. What I didn't necessarily take into account was by being the first major gay character, he was sort of the poster boy for gays. And so I, I later got a lot of shit from gay people that he was kind of a, you know, he had been a Nancy boy, a wimpy sort of character. And that wasn't what we, you know, what we were hoping to see. Um, but it was interesting. I went to a, um, gays and comics panel at San Diego, uh, my, my agent who was gay came along to kind of protect me, she said. Um, but I didn't, I didn't feel I needed protection. But I was getting a lot of shit from the audience about, you know, that this character was not the character that we would have liked to have seen, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I said, you know, I mean, I'm not gay. So I, at the end of the day, what can I tell you? But I mean, I said, there's a whole range of people who are gay. I mean, the idea that one guy has to stand for everybody is, is that doesn't really work. Um, and this was a particular character, just like the racist prime minister of South Africa or whatever. It was just a particular character who happened to have these attributes. And, and, but they, but it went on until finally a guy stood up and he said, um, Gregorio is exactly like the guy that I was living with, but he just died of AIDS. And that kind of kind of put a capper on the on the on the panel. Um, I bet it would. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I mean, it wasn't like there weren't there aren't characters like that. But I do recognize that that I should have probably paid more attention to the fact that being the first one. But I mean, what could I do? I could make him a, a, a stainless hero, but you know, I mean, I didn't. So um, there was that, but it, but definitely the, the, the whole sex, I guess, gay sex and, and AIDS and all that made my editor uncomfortable, um, mm -hmm. which I did not know <laughs> until, <laughs> until I found out. Okay. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a kind of a tough position to be in, you know, it's no matter what you do, you know, it's, it's hard not to upset someone. Um, <laughs> but I thought that was really awesome that you were thinking about doing all this inclusion at a time when inclusion really wasn't, you know, included with, you know, characters that weren't the, the stereotypical, you know, American superhero. Well, um, I really thought, I mean, I honestly did think that having opened that door and I said, it. I remember I said at that panel, Five years from now, there'll be a dozen gay characters. Well, that didn't actually happen either. But <laughs> but uh, I thought, okay, now that now that we've introduced this, it will it will go. But but um, you know, it's not news that a lot of people are not comfortable with gay people, um, and so you the launch pad for the gay characters was was a lot longer. <laughs> than I thought it was going to be. Um, did you have any, because that was kind of right at the end of the run, um, you said that you only generally plotted, you know, you know, maybe a story arc out or, or a little bit ahead, um, but did you have any things like kind of loose dangling plot threads with like, say like the Zamrons and the Guardians kind of being in 
a pocket dimension or, and I know uh, there was some kind of dangling hints at like magic being used like Mary Winden with, with the ring, something like that. Um, but if there was any kind of like dangling threads that you wanted to tie up, but just, you know, didn't have time to. Really there weren't. I mean, I, um, every one of those at the end, we were doing these three issue story arcs and each one of them was kind of, it just, it just let out of the one before it. I, um, that's been my writing style all along. I mean, I don't, to, to use an example that you may or may not know, but I mean, with Mantis over in the Avengers, it took a year and a half mm -hmm. to kind of tell her entire story because I would, you know, I would do something and then I'd go, well, then she would do this next. Mm -hmm. And then, well, if she did that, then she would do this next. And I really had no idea where that was going. It's just, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon me to have it go somewhere eventually, <laughs> you know, uh, but that, I, that was early on in my writing career. And I liked it. I liked the idea that I didn't know necessarily things were going to go. I mean, I might have some idea, but I, you know, I, I use this example a lot, but I mean, if I, you know, if I had the story and I was really going to have Hal Jordan go to Chicago, but instead he suddenly needed to go to Nashville. It's like, well, now he's in Nashville. So the, whatever storyline I was going to do in Chicago has got to change because he's not in Chicago. And, and so that kept it fresh for me. You know, I mean, I'm still telling a story. I'm still going somewhere, but in terms of making it come together, it was, I really liked just seeing where we were and seeing, you know, so um, at the end of the whole Sinestro three of, Part thing, um, I you know I would have looked around and said, okay, well let's see, we've done the Chip story recently, we've done a Salak story recently, um, we did the whole thing where Aresia grew up, which also made un people uncomfortable. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I would have found whatever dangling thread, as you say, was there, uh, but I didn't. Um, until I had to look for it, you know, then this is true for all my books, but I mean, until I had to find what I was going to do next, I didn't really worry too much about how, what I was going to do next. The characters would tell me what I was going to do next. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It's kind of like the, when writers talk about the, the story almost kind of taking on a life of its own and you can really does. Directly. Yeah, it really does. Um, and to, uh, it's still true. I mean, when I write stuff, you know, I'll figure out a plot. I mean, I'll figure out what it is that I'm sort of doing. But in doing it, that's where the details are. That's where the guy suddenly goes to Nashville. And then it's like, well, then, you know, um, I had it all set up for him to be in Chicago. But it's but that's not what he did. He, he you know, because his girlfriend was in Nashville or something. I mean, it's just whatever it is. It's more fun it, it, to let the story. It, you know, it's not just stream of consciousness. It's not like let's do anything because, again, hopefully, I'm supposed to be professional enough to make something out of it. But there's so many. I don't want to be. Um, you know, I don't want to like have a plot so locked down right. that when I get to the to the final issue, I'm just sort of checking off boxes, you know, it's like, oh yeah, he has to do this and he has to do that. It's like, I'd rather go on the adventure, you know, with them and with you. That's you know, uh, we didn't want to keep you too long. So maybe just lastly, uh, is there anything that you wanted to share about your time on the Green Lantern run that we didn't ask about? Uh, no, but it, um, I mean, it had some of my favorite stories. I mean, the one shot where Guy Gardner got them all drunk and they were seeing pink mm -hmm. elephants, you know? I mean, that that just was a weird story, just a weird one-off story. And 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 um, Chip's romantic background and Salak, again, the, the whole thing about Green Lantern being sent to the 52nd century or whatever it is, but they get the wrong Green Lantern. I mean, but everybody there looks thinks that he looks like this other guy, so they don't notice. I mean, I, I 
I just go back to what I said at the beginning. I just think Green Lantern is a hot. It's, there's so much cool stuff with Green Lantern. So many cool things um, to do. So um, I'm just sorry I didn't get to do more of them. Very cool. Did you have uh, anything, Chris, for kind of like a wrap-up question? Uh, not that I can think of right now. Very cool. Um, I think that's all we had. Um, just a couple of things with Lin Wen editor stuff. Uh, uh, speaking of, I guess I just have a little note here about like editors. Um, I guess you had, what was it? Lin Wen and, and Andy Helfer. Um, and I guess maybe Denny O'Neill for a minute. Um, maybe I think of it as being Andy Helfer the whole time, but I was in there. Okay. Yeah, we were just going to um, kind of how it was working with, you know, the different editors and the different writers, especially when you were trying to craft um, like the big line wide events like Millennium and, and uh, Crisis and, and things like that. Kind of um, kind of having to, to work with, you know, not only editors, but different writers and everything kind of having to like coordinate all of it. Well, most writers, um, I mean, um, my brother got married in Houston <clears throat> in the fall of 86, I guess. And Andy flew down to Houston. I was going to be there for a couple of days after the wedding or whatever. I don't remember why. I mean, if there was anything beyond the obvious, but Andy flew down to Houston and it was in Houston um, in his hotel room, basically where we sort of worked out what we were going to do in Millennium. So, I mean, he was essential right from the start on that because we were going to have to talk to all the other editors and we were going to have to, you know, so, you know, but most people, again, are collegial. Um, I mean, uh, there was a lot more of it over at Marvel, but I mean, if you wanted to do a story and somebody else and it used somebody else's character, you basically went to them and said, I got this story and I, you know, and I'd really like to use your character. Is that okay? And nine and a half times out of 10, they were collegial about it. And maybe one time out of 10, they might say, I just can't do that. I'm in the middle of my own story. And I've got this guy and he's doing stuff and I can't break it up. I mean, but gen but nine times out of 10, um, they'd say, yeah, okay, sure. We'll work. We'll, we'll make that happen. Um, there were, I mean, the, the, the prime example was John Broom, sorry, John Byrne. Uh, John Byrne does not play well with people. That's not news. And uh, he didn't want to do it. He was doing Superman and he did not want to have to be part of a company wide thing, but, Again, that wasn't my decision to have the company-wide thing. So in the end, he had to, you know, he had to do it. Um, but, you know, having been on both sides of that, again, my, my ask was pick somebody, anybody you want, and, and let them be a manhunter. Um, I don't want to put it people, you know, they all had to do that, but they didn't have to, you know, they didn't have to sacrifice somebody that they were heavily involved with or anything. Right. So I tried to make it as easy and flexible as possible. And then, um, you know, once they got back to me about, well, who it was going to be and what they planned to do during the two months, they only had to do two months. I had to do eight issues, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, put those together. When are the books coming out? Who are the characters that are in that week? Well, how do I, you know, I mean, that was all, that's, that stuff is fun for me. Um, uh, again, the coherence of it, you know, figuring out a story that fits everybody uh, was, was, was a cool writing challenge, you know, and, and um, fortunately I didn't have to deal with the political uh, challenges. Uh, people who didn't want to play had to be told to play and it wasn't me who had to tell them. Um, so it went, you know, it went surprisingly smoothly, really. It, it, it wasn't wasn't hard to get everybody, most everybody, on board. Um, and then it was just up to me to, to like, how can I make all this flow for eight weeks? 
And again, I liked that part. So. Very cool. Um, I think that's all I had, um, unless you guys had anything. Um, so I just really wanted to say uh, thank you so much for, for taking uh, a little bit of your time to talk with us. This has kind of just been the highlight of our weeks. Uh, we've been. Uh, <laughs> well, I hope you I hope you learn something from all this. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank okay. you. This is a real a real pleasure to uh, to hear about your time on on Green Lantern and some of your thoughts behind the characters and. Yeah, for me to hear about John Stewart and Kilowog and just all these characters that uh, I, I look on so fondly from uh, your run. Thanks for your time and your insights. This has been interesting. Well, you're welcome. And, and again, um, I don't plan on going to any cons until it's safe to sit in an enclosed room for three days with a third of the people unvaccinated. Um, <laughs> so talking to guys like you is... is um, a good, you know, a good thing for me. I mean, I, I, I enjoy going to cons and sitting there and spending three days talking to people about whatever it is. And I don't do that these days. So this was fun for me too. Very cool. I'm, I'm glad you, you feel that way. Uh, that was kind of my purpose for starting all of this. Uh, as I said, it was kind of right in the middle of, of the pandemic, all of this going on. Um, so it was nice to be able to kind of reach out to people that I'd never meet before uh, or wouldn't have met uh, if I hadn't started this uh, from different parts of the country and just being able to kind of sit down and have a conversation. So, yeah, well, I think, I mean, I'm sure you're already finding most people are, are nice people, you know, I mean, they, I mean, if, if you have other people you want to talk to, I would encourage you to go ask them because they probably <coughs> will say yes. Very cool. Yeah, it's 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 been a real treat. Um, like I said, just to kind of get to see the the inside on you know how this come about and uh, some of the things that we were batting around uh, just as we read the stories and went, oh, I wonder you know what he was thinking when he did this. So it, was, <laughs> it was really nice to be able to kind of pick your brain about it and kind of know what was what the thought thought process behind it was. So it's, it's been a real treat. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, guys. Well, thank yes. You. Take care, Steve. Thank you so much again. Bye. Thanks so much. Good night. Bye. Good night.